Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Physiology Secrets Podcast. First of all, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you may notice that uh, it's just me today. Luke and Tyler are out and about doing a bit of work uh, off-site today. So I thought I'd jump on and do a quick little podcast and quite fitting uh, that I'll talk about recovery today and what I call, or what I like to to like refer to as the recovery iceberg. Um, I'm not going to claim as my own because I've seen it thrown around a bit, but it's a really interesting concept about how it can keep recovery quite simple. Um, quite fitting actually that we're talking about recovery this week given that we had Ironman Cairns just happen on the weekend. So I do want to give a quick shout out to the guys who did go up and race, some of our Mets guys, uh, particularly particularly Paul Murray, Ben and Shannon for having a crack uh, at the full distance. Murray doing second, Ben doing second, but uh, Paul and Shannon having a, uh, their first go over the full Ironman distance. So well done to everyone there, and especially I'm gonna I'm gonna give Murray a little bit of an extra shout out for knocking 41 minutes off his PB over the full as well. Really impressive result from from all the guys, and they gave it a really st- uh, strong crack at the race. And then finally uh, Jack as well who had a go at the half uh, for the first time. So again, well done to all the guys. Hope they're recovering up well this week uh, after after some pretty long preparation, some heavy preparation for the guys who've done Ironman uh, and halves before. You know there's a lot that goes into it before race day uh, and some trying conditions uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, has, has obviously made it pretty tough. And once, once everyone got out there, you may be aware that it was pretty ordinary conditions up in Cairns, not beautiful sunny skies like everyone was sort of hoping. So Really well done to them. Uh, recover up well, guys, and, and looking forward to what the new goals are. Second sort of thing to why this makes it interesting, I started to record this episode uh, only a couple of minutes ago, only to be interrupted by a little bit of a delivery that is just over on the couch behind the camera. We had a drop in from Rapid Muscle Recovery Systems. They dropped off a couple of pairs of recovery boots for us, which will be a really exciting addition to our testing that we do here. So you can look forward to that. We're going to do a little bit more and we'll chuck it up on socials about the boots and I might get them on a little bit later and show show you guys how they work and put it up in the Mastermind group and, and show what's going on. But we're hoping it's going to be a nice little one. So when you come in, get your testing done, uh, you'll be able to sit across the, the desk from us and as we go through your data, we can get a bit of that recovery process started, chuck on the boots uh, and sort of freshen up those legs a little bit ready for your next session or, or later on the day. So a bit of an exciting addition, but all of this sort of links in nicely with what I want to talk about. And what I, what I want to go through today is this process or the, this term called the recovery iceberg or the, the theory of the recovery iceberg. And it basically, it basically breaks down the basics of recovery for us uh, in a really simple, easy way to understand. So if anyone who, who has been following uh, particularly my Instagram, I posted about this a couple of, a couple of weeks ago. And the, and the theory of the iceberg basically talks about the, the 10% that we can see the iceberg above the water is all the stuff that you hear about. So things like I just mentioned, the recovery boots, getting a massage, foam rolling, doing some stretching, maybe a bit of an active recovery, so a recovery, recovery swim or recovery bike. Um, all of these aspects of the top 10% that we can see, ice baths, compression, etc. The, these make up the, these make up small portion of recovery and just the icing on the cake. Everything that we can't see that's below the surface, and we know that based on an iceberg, you see that the, the top little portion, but everything, uh, the majority of the iceberg you can't see because it's below the water. Uh, that, that 90% below the water is made up of our, our three core foundations. So sleep, nutrition, and hydration on a daily basis are going to be the, the platform for a really successful recovery process, but then also helping you back up day to day and prepare for the next session. So I just want to take you through a little bit on some of the recommendations around those three aspects. Had a few questions recently, and like I said, it's quite relevant with some, some big races and guys going into, into off seasons now off the back of some of these big Ironman races, Cairns, Port Macquarie was recently as well. Uh, to, to get you sort of thinking around the three key components of recovery and then obviously we can add those little accessory bits on top. So I want to start with sleep first of all because this is this is where the body goes into its most, um, most re- recovery prime state if you like. That's where a lot of the, the muscle repair is happening. That's where we're refreshing our uh, psychologically so our, our brain and our mental, uh, mental side of things is refreshing. It's allowing our, our body to basically shut everything down and, and and sleep is there to re- refresh and recover essentially. So a few guidelines around some daily sleeping patterns. Um, eight to 10 hours a night, most people are aware is the general guidelines for what, what is good in terms of how many hours you can uh, to get in, in terms of athletes getting enough sleep each night. It is a balance though. So getting getting 10 hours of sleep may be great, but if it's not a great quality of sleep, and this is something I get all of all the guys that I coach to track daily is, is they report how many hours they sleep, but then also what what the quality of that sleep was like. It's all very well to get get a long 
period of sleep. But if you're feeling awful waking up and you don't feel the quality was great or you, you, you fall asleep, you wake up, fall asleep, wake up in this sort of repetitive pattern, it may actually may not actually be achieving um, a really good recovery, uh, recovery effect, if you like, or producing a good recovery effect. So, but overall, eight to 10 hours is a general guideline. Some athletes can get away with slightly less sleep. So some guys will report getting six to seven hours. That's kind of individual um, based on working schedules, things like that. Uh, like I said, eight to 10 is generally recommended and it's always at that upper end. So when, when you talk about general population, we talk about some of these sleep guidelines in terms of hours per night. It generally refers to the average person being on the athlete side of things, we generally need a little bit more sleep because we're just doing more physical, physically demanding work throughout the day, uh, particularly as well for some of the guys who are athletes and then in quite physical labor intensive jobs as well. You guys probably need even more sleep uh, than the average athlete does as well. So uh, a key part of the puzzle because that, that sleep process, if you get that right, it really does take out a massive chunk of this 90% we are talking about that bottom part of the iceberg of sleep is a, is a huge component to it. Um, if it's not, not quite hitting the mark there, it's going to delay our recovery even even more so. And you'll feel this throughout training. If you get a poor quality of sleep the night before a big big event or a big race, big training session, you generally don't feel too good. But then also the night after that, that training session or event, if you're not getting a good quality sleep uh, immediate, uh, afterwards, the leading into the next day, you generally feel a little bit sore in the morning, etc. So it does set you up quite well. A few guidelines in how to, on how to get a really good quality sleep. Making sure that the, the environment that you're in is, is quiet, first of all. Um, having background noise, etc., can distract you or, uh, or take you away from being able to relax into, relax into that sleeping pattern or, or um, get prepared to sleep. But also having a dark environment is critical as well. So trying to, trying to keep the room around you or the environment around you as dark as possible, whether that be getting some, some stronger block out blinds, turning off any additional accessory lights that you don't need. Um, getting into a darker environment slightly before you sleep as well. What that helps put you in, particularly the, the removal of light, puts you uh, at a higher level of what they call melatonin, so the, the sleep hormone, if you like. When melatonin is released, it puts us in that sleepy state, uh, and we get that as part of our, part of our basically, uh, our original instincts, if you like. It's what they call a circadian rhythm. It's this natural process of when the sun comes up, uh, our body, our body starts to wake up and adjust to that. When the sun goes down, uh, we we start to move into our sleeping phase. So if you can get the room around you, knowing that we've got we've got lights and things that, like that on, if you can get everything around you a little bit darker, a little bit earlier, or just before you're about to go to sleep, uh, that definitely helps to put you in that more sleepy state and can prepare you to, to go to sleep a little bit quicker um, than just sort of lying in bed for half an hour, hour waiting to to slowly sort of drift off. It can help you get through that that period a little bit quicker. Uh, as a result of that melatonin release, uh, a sort of a side effect from that is yes, we can get the room dark, but a lot of you, a lot of you, I'm sure, uh, and I do it as well. Sometimes have a phone or uh, a TV, uh, an iPad, laptop, whatever nearby just before we're about to sleep, or using one of those devices before we sleep. Again, this is going to play around with that natural rhythm internally. So again, we're getting what's called the blue light. Blue light effect is what we get off our phones, what we get off our laptops, etc. That bright LED screen coming into our face uh, suppresses that release of melatonin. So again, it, it delays that onset of that sleepiness feeling, if you like. So trying to remove some of those away uh, from the environment completely, or just having the discipline to, to stay off your devices, uh, turn off the TV, etc. Sort of in the half an hour, 45 minutes before you aiming to go to sleep, really can accelerate that process in getting to a sleep uh, a lot quicker. A few other things uh, to, to sort of think about, comfortable room temperature, not too hot, but then not too cold. Uh, we want to think about in terms of the, the bedding choices that you use, you obviously don't want to be too hot. Uh, it makes it difficult to go to sleep. Generally speaking, most people will find it a little bit easier to go to sleep in slightly cooler conditions. They generally find over summer, everyone's sort of talking about, oh, gee, it was really hot last night, I had trouble sleeping. Over winter, you don't really hear it as much. Um, and then something like a consistent routine is, is an age-old age old classic as well. So making sure that not necessarily setting a particular bedtime, but being very close to that similar routine of waking up similar times most mornings, not waking up particularly early on any given day or sleeping in uh, a little bit later on particular days, trying to have that consistency and routine is really critical for, for just recalibrating that circadian rhythm. So that natural rhythm of sleep, wake, sleep, wake, uh, as we go day after day as well, uh, can definitely help. So there's a few tips on the sleep side of things. Moving into the hydration, this is a big one that often gets sort of overlooked. Nutrition generally comes first. And so I want to talk about hydration here. 
because it's an easy one to it's an easy one to tick off. It doesn't it, it takes a little bit of discipline, but it's an easy one to tick off in terms of uh, in terms of getting enough. Uh, enough fluid into the body and again the guidelines I'm about to give you think of these as a starting point you may need a greater amount of fluid coming in you may need slightly less but as we sort of talked about I think in a previous episode uh, maybe a week or two ago that uh, we re referred to the stat of about two percent dehydration in an athlete so you don't have to be dehydrated much leads to about a 10% drop in performance. And that, that drop in performance, if we're talking about going into a training session, you may not think is too critical, particularly if it's an easy training session. But if we're talking about chronically, uh, always at 2% dehydration level, 2%, 2%, 2%, we then get into race day and we're slightly dehydrated, that 10% drop in performance is absolutely gonna kill us in terms of aiming for a PB, finishing the race um, a little bit more, uh, or a little bit less fatigued. All these aspects sort of start to accumulate to a, to a poor end result. So what we need to do to try and avoid this 2% drop in dehydration is follow a guideline of about 35 mils of water per kilogram of body weight per day. So to give you a guide on how that would work in terms of the calculation, you basically take 35, multiply it by your body mass, uh, that gives you how many mils across the day. So for someone like myself, about 65 kilos, that equals about 2.2 liters uh, of water per day just to maintain a relatively hydrated state. Again, if we're training, we're sweating a lot, we need to top those, um, top those numbers up, may include some uh, electrolyte supplementation, etc. You can sort of get to the ins and outs of that specific to you, but it's a really good starting point and, and something I've been doing over the last little while and I've got it under the desk is I've got a 2.2 litre drink bottle, which is perfect for me given, given my size, but what this does is uh, if I fill it up at the start of the day, I know that by the end of the day it has to be empty uh, at, at some extent and if I get through a full bottle and a little bit more, Bit of a bonus so you can see i'm always getting to sort of halfway for the day it's what about 2 30 in the afternoon um i've got a bit to go but i know i've got training coming up tonight so i'm gonna i'm really gonna need to fin start getting close to finishing that bottle uh leading into that session and then drink a bit afterwards to to replace some of the fluid i'll lose throughout that training session as well so a good little guide there um once you do add it up and this has actually surprised me as well as uh, in terms of redoing that calculation rethinking through it before I, before i jumped on to record this episode is that 2.2 liters for someone like me i'm not very big 65 kilos reasonably light um that's that's quite a lot of fluid still um in terms of taking it across the day so a lot of a lot of athletes quite easily slip into that two percent dehydration band in terms of not getting anywhere near enough water or fluid in general back into the body just as a result of day-to-day -day activity. So something to think about in particular uh, to eliminate a bit of that dehydrated state uh, as you go chronically, but then also uh, it's gonna help the recovery process. More fluid in the body um, is gonna keep keep our blood consistency similar. And again, that dehydrated state is gonna thicken up the blood as we would have talked about in previous episodes, particularly when we talk about heat load stress, etc. cetera. Um, but if we're losing too much fluid, it thickens up the blood a bit, makes things a little bit more difficult in terms of moving metabolic byproducts around the body, clearing things out. Um, all in all, water is great for the body. Our body is what, 70, 75% water total. Um, so in terms of the body needs water to, to survive and, and keep uh, keep it a homeostasis. So that normal normal state, that comfortable state internally that we like. So we can try and get that, that intake up, that fluid intake up on a daily basis. Definitely gonna help the recovery process and start that recovery process uh, a lot sooner. In terms of nutrition, We've spoken a bit about nutrition a, a, couple, of, a couple of episodes ago when we talk about pre preparing for, for cans in particular and what we do leading into race, etc. So I don't want to touch too much on here, but uh, all, as always, general guidelines around the nutrition side of things, eat a good quality breakfast is always a, is always a good go. Um, get plenty in early in the day, uh, particularly if you're then going to go train. Ideally, eating a, a pretty sort of low GI, high carbohydrate meal two hours before a training session is pretty ideal um, if you can. If you can stomach it as well, this is where it gets a little bit tricky in terms of what you can, uh, what you can handle, or things like that, and what types of foods you might select. But um, and, and like I said, I don't want to go too much into it. But eating eating before a training session is critical because you need to fuel yourself up. But then eating post training session uh, and regularly on a post training session, a few guidelines that I just came back across uh, again today in terms of some reading, talking about things like aiming at carbs and protein back in at about a four to one ratio. So this is where it, this is where it sort of gets interesting in terms of we want to supplement. We don't want to just take, take protein in. So if you're, if you're into your protein shake or you, you're eating a meal to get your protein in, whatever it is, we want to mix it with carbs because we get a greater absorption of that protein and it allows us to start that uh, muscle repair and, and resynthesis of, of muscle, etc. 
and our internal structures that might have been damaged as a result of training because we know training induces fatigue and damage inherently but it's that recovery repair process that uh, that builds things stronger and and ready to, re repairs this ready to go again so taking carbs with our protein about four to one ratio is pretty manageable it allows you to get uh, so for, again for example working off uh, again pretty general guidelines of, of taking about one and a half grams per kilo of carbohydrate at a four to one ratio for someone again like me using my numbers 65 kilos what does that mean that means immediately post session i need to be getting in about 97 and a half grams of carbohydrate but with that i need to be getting in about 24 grams of protein and this is after this is after a pretty pretty solid session i mean if you're going out and doing a 20 minute pretty cruisy run probably not too much of a of a necessity to get as much of that back in but we're sort of talking if you go out on the bike and you're out there for two and a half three hours pretty solid session um, or longer session we definitely want to be getting high intensity sessions even we definitely want to be getting plenty of fuel back into the body immediately because that that recovery process starts as soon as we finish that training session it's not a case of as soon as you finish your, your interval or as soon as you finish your set bang you have to get straight into the meal um, or, or get into get something into your body but definitely that first half hour window is pretty critical. But even the next sort of eight hours, it's been shown in some research to, to be quite critical as well. So it's maintaining this, uh, this refueling process in terms of nutrition uh, throughout the day, throughout the afternoon, wherever your training session is, that next eight hours is, is quite important. And if we're talking training later in the day, training after work in the afternoon, Getting some quality quality fuel back into the body early is critical because then obviously if we're going straight to straight to sleep or, or sleep in a short period of time after training, we then are missing potentially eight to ten hours worth of refueling time because we're not going to be able to refuel while we're sleeping. So we have to we have to fuel our body enough so that when we are in that sleeping state and we're trying to recover, all that fuel is going to a good use throughout the body, and we're not we're not wasting any of that that process. So we're getting really effective refueling uh refueling connection going on and it sort of then combines well with our sleeping habits drinking water throughout that time and, and this is where all three sort of combine together is that that 90 percent are all sort of intertwined if we can if we can get enough fluid back in we can get our carbs and our protein in post session and then that sets us up for really good quality sleep uh going through some of the points i talked about before we're going to be able to use some of those, those fuels those carbs and protein but then also a little bit of that fluid to help that recovery process as we sleep so Again, it's this, it's this inner workings or that, that intertwined workings of, of three different parts of our recovery, sleep, hydration, nutrition, that start to come together to produce that 90%. Uh, and if, we can, if you can adhere to some of these guidelines, um, so like I said before, in terms of, in terms of daily hydration, uh, about 35 mils of water per kilo per day, trying to get eight to 10 hours of good quality sleep and, and reasonably routine, consistent sleep. And then in terms of fuel intake, a four to one ratio, four to one ratio of carbs versus protein. So one, one and a half grams of carbs uh, per body weight of mass. So again, for a 65 kilo athlete myself, it's like 97 and a half grams of carbs to 24 grams of protein. Um, ideal, ideal numbers there in terms of exact numbers. In, again, it's working off a bit of a calculation, so it is going to be slightly different for everyone. But that that carb and protein aspect working together is really critical. So. I'm going to leave it there because I've covered quite a bit already in terms of what's what's going on in this recovery iceberg aspect, and I really want to nail that. And if there's anything you're going to take away from today, that recovery is quite simple at the end of the day. I know I've talked quite a lot about the ins and outs of sleep, hydration, nutrition. It's important for recovery, but if you can nail those three aspects, all of these other one percent at the top only make up a small part of recovery. Um, ice baths, compression, recovery boots, massages, foam rolling, stretching, uh, doing an active recovery. All of these are just the top top part of the iceberg that, that might be a flashy thing that you've seen a pro athlete do or uh, might make you feel good, but having good quality sleep, be, staying hydrated and, and keeping refueled is going to do a lot more physiologically and internally uh, prior to that and set you up so that those little one percenters make the most of, of that earlier effect. So hopefully you got a little bit out of uh, out of the podcast today. I'm going to quickly go over in a moment and uh, chuck on these new recovery boots from the guys at Rapid Recovery Systems um, to give them a crack. So have a look out on our socials uh, for some content around those recovery boots and, and what our thoughts are on them. Looking forward to getting some of you guys in for some testing and test out the recovery boots and see what you uh, see what you think for yourself but otherwise hopefully you've enjoyed this little episode of the physiology secrets podcast any questions from you guys that you want answered on the podcast as always chuck them in the mastermind group you guys are the first guys in the mastermind if you are involved in the mastermind group to see the podcast every week and we're going to be starting putting more and more content in there that's mastermind specific so if you're not already a part of the group check out the link down below sign up 
it's a free group at the moment to, to join. Jump in the Facebook community. There's plenty of other like-minded individuals asking some great questions in there. And we're going to get some more mastermind-specific content to you guys that uh, no one else is going to be able to get. So if you are watching this podcast and you're interested, things to do more with what we did with 2000 Watt Challenge, things to do with uh, Luke's, Luke's build to Gold Coast, Gold Coast Marathon, a little bit of a sneak peek into what Tyler's doing for Xterra Off-Road World uh, Triathlon Championships later this year as well. There's some really exciting stuff coming in the in the next little while, so definitely encourage you to get involved in the mastermind. But otherwise, hopefully you've enjoyed this episode and we'll see you in the next one.